Um, thanks for sticking with us here to our last panel, um, which is about indigenous knowledge and will be moderated by Professor Trosper, to whom I will hand the floor. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. It's been a wonderful day. And I want to uh, do a brief introduction to the panel. We have four members of the panel. I believe there's two online and two here. And uh, I was interested in the last panel in hearing folks say that they're, they're talking about distinguishing between co management and co stewardship. The co stewardship is being criticized as if that was no, not as, as less than co management. As I understood what people were saying, but I think it's better because the word stewardship brings in some of the virtues of, of indigenous knowledge, and so that that, that uh, is important. I'm I'm a, I'm a member of the Santa Shikuni tribe, so you heard the story of the bison range at home and the efforts that my tribe has made to convince people that if we take over the management, things will get better. And that, that I think that's been a conscious strategy to build relationships with people and convince them that actually it's helpful. And we, we, we took over all control of all the docks on Flathead Lake Place. And the people that were registered, uh, regulating the docks, the landowners were afraid they were going to be told what to do. But really what we tried to say is we will tell you how to build docks, docks that won't get all the way, docks that will do the job and we'll save the lake at the same time. So we tried to make the point that using tribal knowledge or indigenous knowledge was beneficial rather than a problem. And I think we heard that this morning, starting from the very beginning, Ox presentation, where mm -hmm. you made it clear that the knowledge of, from in California of managing and making that land productive is something that needed to be brought back into work. And so, I'm, I'm encouraged then that we should we should look at indigenous knowledge as something that will contribute to uh, the stewardship of land. And, and so, what I want to do is, have, uh, rather than introduce everybody at length, I, I'll give you brief introductions as we go around the first time. And then, uh, what we're going to do is first talk about defining indigenous knowledge or indigenous science. What do we mean by that? How is it different from other kinds of knowledge? Then we're going to spend quite a bit of time about how does indigenous knowledge incorporated into law and policy, something that we've already <laughs> talked about already today. How should indigenous knowledge be protected given some of the tensions that arise with the private property system? And finally, at the end, what hope, what hope do we have? What brings us hope in the stories that we so let's get going. And uh, so the first question is about what are the key differences between indigenous scientific values and land management principles and Western scientific values and land management principles. We've heard about some this morning, but we'd like to have Chairman Good and uh, Jade McGay handle that. And so, since it's Jade's name is listed first, Jade, can I handle the door over for you? You're uh, Director of Policy and Advocacy at the Indian Collective, and you've had quite a bit of experience described here in terms of using Indigenous knowledge. So would you like to uh, take a shot at that first question about the key differences uh, between Western science and Indigenous knowledge? Yes, can everyone hear me? Just checking. Yes. Audio. Okay, great. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm, uh, as was just shared, thank you for that intro. I'm Jade. Um, and uh, again, as was shared, I, I work uh, as the policy and advocacy director at Indian Collective. Um, but really, my, my intersections. Um, and my background, just to uh, share context, uh, comes. I, my background come, is in environmental justice and climate justice work. Um, so I am really seeing um, when we're talking about indigenous traditional ecological knowledge or knowledge systems, um, I really am seeing those through the lens of how we elevate uh, 
climate, or sorry, how we elevate uh, ITEK um, and those knowledge systems uh, to advance or achieve climate and environmental justice. And I think um, just to kind of uh, share this, uh, sh share this kind of, uh, way of thinking around, and you already have heard me kind of already say, you know, the difference between like knowledge versus knowledge is, and I just want to explain some of that language uh, before I dive deeper. Um, so why do we say traditional knowledge is? Um, and I th that's because um, we have larger systems um, when we're talking about indigenous knowledge. So um, we use the phrase traditional knowledge is deliberately in plural form because knowledges are um, emergent from um, the symbiotic relationship of indigenous peoples and places um, and this nexus of culture and nature. Um, and tribes and indigenous peoples use knowledges to emphasize that there are um, many and diverse forms of traditional knowledge and knowledge systems that must be recognized um, uh, and recognized as unique to also each tribe and knowledge holder. Um, so yeah, a little wonky there, but you know, I think when we're doing advocacy, especially in um, spaces like the UN or within you know advocacy to uh, the federal government, or agencies, it's important to be um, clear about what we're saying and why, and why we're using certain terms. So um, yeah, thank you for indulging me in that kind of nerdy bit. But um, uh, again, language matters. And so, so I think, oh, go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. And that's very helpful to emphasize that we are dealing with Knowledge is not just one knowledge or one system. And that, that's true of both sides, but it's particularly true of the indigenous side. Uh, Ron Good, you've been very active with burning and so forth. And uh, we'd like to know what your view is on tribal, on, on tribal knowledges and what uh, your view is on how it's useful uh, for, for, the, for everybody. I'm Manahu. I'm Ron Good, the tribal chairman of the North Fork Mono Tribe out here in California. <clears throat> and um, just a real quick um, uh, thought on Western science is only about 120 years old. Native science and indigenous knowledge is generational and comes down from thousands of years of our people being on the land. Not only what we've observed, mm -hmm. but what we've practiced and the successful outcomes. And so then that's where we usually start. We start when the Euro-American came to our, our land and what, it, what the land looked like, what kind of, how were the resources? Why, why was the Euro-American able to, um, you know, had a gold mine wherever he went, rather would better what kind of resources he reached, he or she reached for. And it was there because when using fire and using fire as a tool, we were able to make the landscape into the uh, type of successful resources that we needed to be able to live on the land for thousands of years. I think that's a really important point that, that we had. Hawk made that earlier. And uh, so let, let's move along to asking the two folks that work with governments what they see about the steps that are needed to bring uh, the use of indigenous knowledge into these systems. And I'll start with asking Anthony Morgan, Anthony Morgan Rodman about it, and then we'll end up talking about how it <clears throat> happens at the international level. So why don't you talk about that, what what uh, the project looked like to include indigenous knowledge guidance for the agencies. We've heard a lot about 
how there might be some resistance and how long there's also anxious to use, people are anxious to use it. So how does it work out in, in the federal government? Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Trosper. Uh, again, my name is Morgan Rodman. I serve as Executive Director of the White House Council on Native American Affairs. I'm a Cherokee and Osage from Oklahoma, and I'm also a graduate of the University of Arizona School of Law. So it's great to be back. And thank you all so much for having, uh, having me. Very humbled by that. So ensuring an inclusive, meaningful, and Indigenous-shaped and Indigenous-led um, definition of indigenous knowledge was always at the forefront of the Biden administration's effort with this initiative. This is always going to be guided, again, led by tribal voices and perspectives. And that's happened through a campaign of outreach um, to experts, to advocates, and through nation to nation dialogue between the federal government and tribal nations. There are two offices from the White House that led this cross-agency effort. And those offices were the Office of Science and Technology Policy, or otherwise known as OSTP, and the Council on Environmental Quality, otherwise known as CEQ. And for a brief background, OS, OSTP advises the president on the effects of science and technology on domestic and international affairs. And CEQ coordinates across the federal government on environmental policies and initiatives. So OSTP and CEQ co-led this indigenous knowledge effort in the first year of the Biden administration, which stemmed directly from tribes saying for many years that indigenous knowledge must be respected and recognized and that it has value in federal policy among other things. So step one in this process was that OSTP and CEQ issued a policy memorandum to the whole executive branch of the federal government in the first year of the Biden administration. President Biden actually announced this memo at the Tribal Nation Summit in 2021. And so this memo in year one recognized indigenous traditional ecological knowledge as one of the many important bodies of knowledge that contributes to the scientific, technical, social, and economic advancements of the United States and to our collective understanding of the natural world. So you may have noticed that the term has broadened a bit in the new memo to indigenous knowledge instead of indigenous traditional ecological knowledge. And that happened because of that outreach campaign and talking to experts and tribes, they informed this effort by saying this should really be indigenous knowledge instead of ITEC. So this year one memo also indicated the formation of a work group, an interagency work group, and it also previewed to, to everyone that there's gonna be more guidance to come. And so OSTP and CEQ led this work group. It involved over 25 federal agencies that worked together over the course of a year to engage over 100 tribes, over 1,000 individuals and organizations, had three tribal consultations, two Hawaiian and Pacific Islander roundtables, an indigenous youth roundtable, and more engagements to develop a second and more detailed policy memorandum that was announced at this last year's Tribal Nation Summit. So the second memo builds off the first one and aims to serve at least three major goals. One, to assist federal agencies in understanding indigenous knowledge. Two, growing and maintaining mutually beneficial relationships with tribal nations and indigenous peoples. And three, considering, including, and applying indigenous knowledge in federal research, policies, and decision-making. So there are best practices in that second memo, a list of research, and several promising examples of how IK has been incorporated in the federal government. Thank you very much, that's helpful. And I'd like to turn the floor over to our special rapporteur to talk about the international convention. And I'm particularly, earlier we had mentioned several different Presenters mentioned the 30 by 30 policy that on conservation that was recently articulated at that meeting in, in Montreal. And I also want to point out that related to that, my own tribe was one of the folks that saved the buffalo. And then we ended up creating our own park and then got excluded from the park. And now we're finally uh, recognized as people to should be managing the park. And I'm wondering how that experience relates to your experiences with the conservation movements and the use of science in general. 
Well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. And I think that uh, uh, as a second thing to you is that you are not using any more traditional knowledge. Uh, that is a very a good advance uh, in this moment because uh, really, personally, I am against the use of traditional knowledge. I try not to say it. However, I have to teach a course named it. <laughs> and, and when I teach the course, the first discussion topic is what's wrong with the name of this course? <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that is why, because uh, even I'm going to say something that uh, uh, in a very respectful way is that. Uh, a, the point of view or the scientific Eastern point of view. I'm talking about Eastern, no West, because West is China and Asia. Yes. And we are wrong even geographically. So I think that it's not the, the point of view of the scientific Western society, the Eastern society. Eastern society. Thank so you. I think that that is because we are here in this continent. That is very important to also clarify because of poor. Asian, they don't, they don't know, they don't have anything to do with that here. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the CBD define a, a traditional knowledge, uh, specifically as a method of uh, working and the knowledge that indigenous people have. But I think that, that why I am saying that it's not traditional knowledge is because how I am going to tell my own people that is a traditional knowledge when they created the more perfect calendar in the history of humanity. For my tradition, I don't think so. They have to have a scientific knowledge to create that, uh, uh, to create that, uh, that, that uh, uh, management of the time. So, and of course, uh, uh, CBD is also talking about uh, local uh, indigenous people and local communities. Who are local communities? There is not any definition of who are uh, local communities. In some states, even today, they are trying to uh, to practice or to give local communities that don't, nobody knows who are the local communities the same right of indigenous peoples. So I think that that is uh, that is very important to say. And the, the thirty by thirty. Unfortunately, I have to say that uh, I've been saying internationally and I've been denouncing that uh, the 30 by 30 policy because there is a commitment of the states to protect 30% of the biodiversity in the world. But I have not seen any of those countries or any of those states, they, they are doing something to, to protect biodiversity. And uh, we take in account that uh, the surface of the earth where indigenous people are living is represent only 20, 20%. It kept 80% of biodiversity. So what that means, the under policy that I'm seeing and in this moment from 2013, is that the state are going to take over the land of the indigenous people to say that they are protecting indigenous people. And how they are doing that? creating a protected areas. As you were mentioning that uh, you, you expressed yourself today, that the Buffalo Park, they are not taking an account in it. So that is something that I am trying to, to explain to everybody that I am not against the, the protection of biodiversity. I am against the policy that in the states are not launching in this moment. So that is a, 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 the, the, the biggest line of the state are that they are saying that they are going to protect 30 percent uh, of the biodiversity, but they are not doing anything. And by uh, 2050, they are saying that they are going to protect 50 percent of the biodiversity of, of, of the of Earth. So, but what uh, they are doing in this moment, I see nothing in this. And that's my experience as a special. No, and that, that, that makes me think back to the policies on my own reservation where they, they wanted to protect the buffalo and, and they and they left us out of the park. <laughs> and so I'm I'm wondering what, what's happening now? Is there is there do you think that, that it's possible for people to start recognizing the value of traditional knowledge, the way in which the people who actually created the biodiversity should be consulted and put in charge of the stewardship? You think that idea is what? That is what I am trying to, to, to think in the moment as a special report. 
The problem is that the state, and you, and you can see two years ago, we had a very strong fight against uh, Thailand. When they created uh, the Kachang uh, uh, protected area, even that uh, as a special report too, and with other international NGO, we presented evidence, facts that is showing the human right violation of the state of Thailand against the Karen people. The committee in UNESCO, they didn't care. And they told me that it, there wasn't a human right uh, uh, far. So that means, uh, how, uh, the, uh, what that means? It means that uh, something is wrong because United Nations Agency has to work on the base of respect for human rights. So that means that if somebody, some state are committing a, even a gross violation of human rights uh, to be examined by those, uh, those entities, it has to be why they are trying to, have to create those protected areas. In this moment, the current people are living outside of their territory, outside of the, of the country, and many of them, they are uh, stateless people in this moment. Because either Thailand or what is the name of the other country? Laos or Burma. Burma. Burma, they are not uh, recognizing any of the people who are living in the uh, refugee camps. So that is the problem that, that I am seeing. And I can mention many other things, many other examples in Latin America even here in the US and also in, in, in Canada. So that is the problem that I am seeing in this moment. How the state are taking advantage of those policies and they are taking over the indigenous people. It's really an issue. And my, my <clears throat> feeling is that in doing that, they say they're doing it in order to protect biodiversity and they're violating human rights, but they're also violating biodiversity because the people that were creating and taking care of it are being excluded. So it seems Do you to have a, You have a very good example in the US. Yes. Yellowstone Park. Yes. They took over the control of Yellowstone and everything. And, and they didn't uh, allow, uh, oh, they started to kill all the wolves and everything because they wanted to protect the people. They wanted to protect other uh, kind uh, of, of, of uh, wild animals. But then what was happening? The biodiversity started to, to be lost because the buffalo and the other animals, they were eating everything there until they allowed again to, or they brought wolves again to Yellowstone. So then the balance of the biodiversity and diversity started to grow up again. Why? Because more they are starting to hunt again. They, they were like, uh, nature is very important, uh, also a uh, resource of knowledge of indigenous people. And indigenous people are studying that. It's not only by custom, it's because they are analyzing all the issues that is taking place. And indigenous people, they were saying, no, you don't have to take out the walks from, from Yellowstone. <coughs> so now it's a, it's a balance in this moment in Yellowstone. So there are something that we have to learn. Yes, we need to figure that out. And I'd like to turn the table, to turn the mic over to Chairman Good to talk about the uh, role of fire in California and what knowledge you, you, you and your communities bring to uh, management uh, and, and protection of biodiversity through your management of fire. Well, thank you very much. Um, appreciate the the time we're um we've got a number of things going right now out here where we as a tribe have been burning on federal lands for about 23 years and burning taking care of our resources for a little bit longer than that of course <clears throat> just a little bit but, longer <laughs> yeah but in order to well let me let me just put a little bit of background into that because um, we were basically ran off of our gathering areas and our areas that we needed for our resources for basketry and and other plants and medicines uh, for some 20, 30 years on some of the federal lands. And then we were finally able to get back in and 
restore them. So from about the 1960s to 2000, uh, there were a point in time when we were pretty much run off of the land. And now since that time though, we have started to restore our meadows and our, our uh, uh, watersheds and then our cultural resources. So with that, uh, it, takes, it took a little bit of time, uh, you know, and a little bit at a time to do one meadow, pretty soon three meadows, pretty soon six meadows. We're up to 15 now, and I got nine more to do this summer. And, but it, again, we built our relationship with the forest and the parks in the sense that uh, we kind of had to prove what we could do and the fact that we still not only had the knowledge, but the understanding of that knowledge. And that's key. Um, you can have you can have TEK traditional ecological knowledge, but if you don't have the TCP, which is the traditional cultural practice, then you really are not aware of how the cultural, the ecological knowledge works. You just have the knowledge until you can put the practice on the ground, like actually being put and fired out there to burn your resources, um, to have an understanding. And that of course is where we are in California, that we are caught in this little bit of a conundrum that um, in order for tribes to put fire on the ground, they've got to become firefighters. They've got to create their own firefighting units or they have what the new program is called a TREX program. It's a training program, but yet it's still the, basically the same thing. You have to be red carded and wear your little yellow suits and, and go out there and have your water trucks and fire trucks and in order for you to put fire on the land. And let me come back to that in just a second. But with cultural burning, we're cultural burners and uh, we are not red carded. We are not gonna wear little yellow suits. We go out there and burn what we're supposed to burn. And that's a real key issue to cultural burning that over the last 20 years, um, in like this year, for instance, one of our burns, we had 70, 70 burns over 50 acres. We never lost one single fire. But my Forest Service and park folks, friends, they constantly lose fires. It might only be five acres, 10 acres, 15 acres. You folks back in Washington, D.C. are not going to hear about it unless it's 200 acres they've lost. And so you have no idea how many small fires get away from them when they shouldn't have any fires getting away from them. And so this is a part of the, the challenge with cultural burning. And just to throw it out there in a little more logistics, culture means to cultivate. So that means that we're, in a sense, we're doing agriculture on our resources. And if that's the case, then why would you go out there and light up your, your landscape and, and let it get away from you. That's, you know, that, that's just not what you're supposed to be doing. Um, but backing up just a second, when I talked about all those, those, um, those items that you have to have when you're a forest service and park service, you know, we're being, being red carded and yellow jackets and fire trucks and water trucks and all the tools. If you read the the federal laws on fire, it says if you have to have that many red carded firefighters and that many yellow jackets and that many fire trucks and that many water trucks, you are at risk and you should not be lighting a fire. And those are the rules, but that's not how it works, you know? The, the 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 agencies won't put fire down unless they have that. So if there's a wildfire and they plan a prescribed burn and they don't have all of that equipment, 
then they don't burn. And consequently, this is when the wildfires are coming out here now, the mega wildfires, it's because nobody's been burning. And everything just is, is brush, overgrown, dried, dying. And of course, the fire gets called to those to that landscape. It, but versus with the cultural burning, cultural burning is that we can, when we burn, so I'm going to go back to the last burn I just did, which was big for us. We had 196 uh, attendees. And like I said, we did 70 small burns, over 50 acres. We had a lot of smoke, not one neighbor, not one township complained. And nobody in the valley even knew we burned because it wasn't big enough. But when the agencies put fire on the land, 500 acres, 1,000 acres, 5,000 acres, then everybody complains because the smoke is everywhere, the particles are, are everywhere, particulates. So, you know, there, there lies some of the differences between what we need to address and how we need to address it. But because of what I keep talking about, how we burn small, even we even have problems with environmentalists in our in our collaborative collaborations and as well as the agencies oh that's just too small the agencies when they burn they burn for acreage because that's how they get paid they get reimbursed for the amount of acreages they burn you know for, for us it's about the resource that we want to we have returned for our culture because that's why we used fire. That's what we use fire for. And when we have our burns, we have a dozen or more basket makers, the elders and brand new uh, young ones out there learning how to gather, learning how to clean a stick, learning how to make a basket, listening to stories, listening to songs, all this part is a part of culture and they're right there with us while we're lighting fires and they're out gathering from last year and the year before and that's the way it's supposed to work that's very helpful to to bring in again we've heard throughout the day we've heard the importance of bringing the youth the children in and you brought, you brought that up again and you also mentioned that your stories <clears throat> relate to this. I'd like, to, I noticed that in, in her biography, Jade mentions uh, experience in storytelling and so forth. And I wondered if you'd like to come on in on the discussion on this, uh, Jade. Yeah, what, what is the question? The question is, uh, what's the role of youth and storytelling and explaining traditional knowledge. Uh, Ron Good mentioned that. He mentioned the importance of bringing the youth in and educating people of knowledge as, as, you, as you use it. And I'm wondering if this is something that you'd like to address. Yeah, I think I, think I can, uh, yeah, kind of answer the, the initial question too, and then come back. Yes, do that this one and and kind of round it all out. So um, I think the, I, I just wanna to speak to the, the first question at the top of the discussion around the differences uh, between uh, indigenous traditional knowledge systems and Western models of land management. And I think what chairman was just saying around um, some of the problematic uh, pieces that we're seeing when with how land is managed or stewarded by agencies uh, speaks to just that. Um, you know, t traditional knowledges have guided um, indigenous interactions with landscape for millennia. We we all know that, um, and in recent decades, scientists, policymakers, and others have, um, I think become really increasingly aware of the importance and value of traditional knowledges in informing their land management practices. Um, as, as Morgan was sharing, 
Um, you know, we've seen this like amazing, uh, these memorandums and these proclamations around how to elevate uh, traditional ecological knowledge and federal decision making. I think I, I am personally very concerned about the how. I think these proclamations are uh, wonderful steps in the right direction. However, we need to really dial in like how it's done. Um, and so, you know, these these roundtables are great, but I think involving people like um, Chairman Good here, involving people um, uh, from community, not just tribal leaders, is really critical for how we uh, we do the implementation piece around around uh, elevating traditional ecological knowledge systems into federal uh, decision making. And to just speak to the the youth piece, um, a couple dots I want to connect. So here at NDN Collective, um, we we know that traditional ecological knowledge, um, indigenous indigenous traditional ecological knowledge systems are critical in Climate, uh, climate adaptation and mitigation and in uh, building climate and achieving climate justice. So um, I have uh, with my team developed a program which we call uh, the Climate Preparedness Program. And really what the, the, the goal of this program within our organization um, aims to do is reconnect, re um, reintroduce native and indigenous peoples to indigenous traditional ecological knowledges, whether that's um, language, whether that's um, uh, you know, various types of uh, food harvesting or food preservation or seed banking or uh, you know, fire. We got we got to partner with uh, Chairman Good uh, just this past January around a burn in their community. And, and as we all know, you know, so many of our people were removed from our, our territories, from our lands, um, and disconnected from our knowledge systems. And so, uh, you know, I think, um, yes, we have to advocate for the advancement of knowledge systems and the recognition and how how those all play into policy making and impact policy making but we also have to think of um the the fact that so many indigenous peoples you know are, are have been disconnected from these knowledge systems and we need to repair that disconnection so our program aims at making accessible um, pathways for indigenous youth, indigenous peoples to connect with those knowledges. Um, so we've led and sponsored different workshops where that's possible. Um, and I, I, you know, just I, I think another like holistic piece of this or another piece of this holistic um, healing work is, is, uh, is the focus on health and equity. Our, our knowledge systems can't exist or can't be um, uh, carried on if our people aren't healthy. And so I think health and um, health equity and public health come into play here where we need strong policies that keep native and indigenous peoples healthy so that we can continue to share and exchange and, um, and keep our knowledges going. Um, so I just I just wanted to call that in because this is not just a climate issue. This is not just an environmental issue. This is also, you know, a social equity issue, particularly around the health piece. Uh, we need our people to be well, and we need our elders to be well to be able to carry on these knowledges. Thank you very much. Um, I'd, I'd like to hand the floor over uh, to Anthony Morgan to see how the federal government or the agencies react to these, these important things of emphasizing the practices with regard to fire or, that, or developing the knowledge systems and continuing with regard to use. What, how is that resonating in DC? 
Yeah, well, thank you for that. And thank you, Jade, uh, for those points. And I think Jade is exactly right. Like we're at the implementation stage of this now. We're at the implementation stage of a lot of initiatives that were announced at the Tribal Nation Summit. And for the Indigenous Knowledge Guidance Memo itself, it is largely through a nation-to-nation -nation framework, the way that that um, is, is positioned. So for instance, consent is a big point of that Indigenous Knowledge Memo. We don't want to have Indigenous Knowledge guidance that's not vetted and approved by the authoritative body for that knowledge and have it in a federal public document. So there's that mechanism that is identified in that Indigenous Knowledge Memo. So the consent is a big part of that. Um, as we're implementing this across the federal government, there are certain accountability measures in there as well. There's a 180-day report that agencies have to submit next month, actually, about where they are with implementation. That's submitted to um, the National Science and Technology Council. And I would like to say that the National Science and Technology Council is where this effort will be housed moving forward. And that gives the Indigenous Knowledge Guidance um, a home and some permanence that it's never had before. So as that report comes out and we see where agencies are, there will be a continued focus on the engagement. That's how the document got to where it is right now, is through that campaign of outreach. So there'll be a nation to nation consultation, but there will also be listening sessions um, where uh, we can engage with experts, activists, people that know this issue. And that, that gives a space where it's in addition to nation to nation dialogue, this listening session, other engagements. And then there are a lot of committed leaders to this yeah. in this in this administration to indigenous knowledge. And the challenge is just to make sure that this is embedded, this is effective. And that's what this year is going to be, it's going to be about for the IK guidance. Wow. So it sounds like things are moving along in a way that is unexpectedly good in, in what you described. That, that, uh, you're actually asking the agencies to report back how they're doing in implementing the, the use of traditional knowledge or the use of indigenous knowledge. Yes. That, that's really helpful. Um, I'm wondering what, in that process, you mentioned that you wanted to be sure that the holders of the knowledge were involved in it and also were approved that it was good. And I, I found that to be very interesting because one of the complaints that you might hear from the traditional, what could I call them, the traditional, the mainstream science. I don't want to call them Western or Eastern science because then I'll get all caught up in <laughs> it's this question of who's, whose science are we talking about? So let's say mainstream science. Yeah. They, they often say, well, we can't put this knowledge into our report unless it's been peer reviewed. And I see this, for instance, is a big principle in the climate reports. They only put in stuff that, they, that has come to a consensus among the folks who are identified as scientists. But you emphasize that the indigenous knowledge that you would use has to also be approved to go through a vetting process within the knowledge system it's coming from. It's yes. interesting to me that that's something that's on the table in DC. And there's something relevant to that in that indigenous knowledge guidance memo as well. You mentioned the, the peer review and the fact checking and the um, non indigenous uh, science realm, if we want to call it that. But there is a section in that IK guidance memo that says the knowledge that comes, the indigenous knowledge that may be applied to federal policies does not need to be fact checked. Or there's a, there's a, it acknowledges that this is just as equal to the non indigenous science. And there's language in there that is guarding against bias, you know. And so I would encourage everyone to look at that language as well. But there's some strong language. So it's very interesting because uh, I, I've done some work with people in the Dark West Coast, and they emphasize that even with regard to their oral history or their oral or their stories, that they 
vet the story so that a, a leader has to prove that he can tell the story that everybody agrees is the right story. So it's a, a process of, uh, even in storytelling, there has to be a vetting process and a community engagement in making sure that it's agreed to and right. And so it's very interesting to see that that, that process is getting recognition from bureaucracies in DC. That's really interesting. I'd like to open the floor for any other member of the panel to speak up on this topic. Probably, I think that um, uh, to answer more directly to your first question is that um, uh, I believe that um, indigenous knowledge has doesn't have to be uh, defined by the international law. Yes. I think that uh, it has to be even, uh, even not protected. I think that the only thing that they have to do is to respect that knowledge, initial knowledge. So because, uh, as you say, and uh, unfortunately, uh, the indigenous knowledge has to be approved by the scientific uh, society. No, I was saying that there's a difference. Is the indigenous yeah, yeah. knowledge going to be approved by the indigenous community? Oh, no, no, that's or is it correct. going to be validated by the scientific community? And having it approved by the indigenous community. But it's, it's almost the same. It's only, it's only a semantic issue because it has to be validated. Yes. So that is the same. So why do you have to be validated? We are not validating their scientific knowledge. We are only respecting that. So that is what I, I'm trying to say. And even today, the scientific uh, uh, society, the European scientific society, they are calling all the scientific community to look back to indigenous scientific knowledge because they are saying that it's the one of the possibility to save the survival of humanity because of climate change. So I think that that is what we need in this moment, just to look back and to respect that scientific knowledge of indigenous peoples. So I think that there is a, a, a great advance in, in this moment, so. Good, yes, thank you. Anyone who's online, do you want to break in here? Chairman Good. Chairman Good. Jane. Yes. Uh, put my hand down. Um, just a, a couple of really interesting points there that you guys are bringing up. You know about consent and how does um, how to protect our our traditional ecological knowledge. Um, I know for for media because I have media around me a lot, and basically I refuse to sign any of their documents. And I tell them if if I allowed you if I allow you to film me or interview me, then I'm saying it's okay for you to use my information. What I'm going to give you, I just need to be careful what I give you. But if I have to sign one of your documents that says you own my information, once I give it to you, then I'm not signing it, nor will I ever invite you back. And that's kind of been the case over the, over, over the years. Um, in the last seven months, I've written seven different articles. Uh, two or three of them are now being published. And interestingly that, you know, some of the reviewers, one asked who authorized, who authorized you to use TEK? <laughs> you know, me as the tribal chairman, okay. And then, um, you know, the peer, peer review situation is always there that, that whatever uh, we're saying, because if they're they're requesting my experience and my knowledge, but they're still going to peer review it, and it's not by native people; it's by non-native people, academics. Then the other thing that um, on a, one of our articles. Um, in order for it to get published, when we finally got to the very end, then we had to sign it over 
because as authors, we owned the information. So mm -hmm. then in order for us to have it published, we had to transfer our ownership to them. And I was, I was writing with two young colleagues and I wanted them to be noted and especially in this journal. And so we signed over, signed our, signed our authorship over to them in order for the, the article to get published. And, and now they supposedly own it, right? So what happened though, was that once I discovered that was going to happen, I revised my article and pulled out every story and every, every relationship to a story that was cultural and pulled it out of the article. So that basically it's the same stuff that I may be talking about in general. And so they didn't get to have any of my, my actual cultural stories that related to the article because I wasn't going to let them own that. And um, I was the lead author for the California um, fourth California climate change assessment in 2018. And I had nine authors. And for my articles, they were constantly validated by people that were not Indian by people that were not even from our state, but somebody that had made a statement uh, similar to what I was making. And then that was okay to include my statements because it now had been validated. Plus they also plagiarized a few of my other authors from what one author said and tried to put it with another author. And it was like, so now this time around when we have the climate change, nobody's helping them and definitely not me but th that's the one of the problems the issues that we are faced with how how do we take care of that knowledge and for till finish but with uh, with my tribe and many others the way that we've protected our resources and the way that we've protected our knowledge is by not telling it but we are at a point now i think the world is at a point to where they need to hear more from us because we hold that knowledge. Our ancestors have passed it down to us and it's gonna be important for the world to go forward with. Thank you for making that point. It's, I've often noticed that, uh, in fact, I've sometimes teased elders who, who, who get very, they, they, someday they will say, well, we, our knowledge is valuable, we need to protect it. But on the other hand, our knowledge is really important. It needs to be heard. And how do you do both? And you're saying, and, and uh, you're saying, well, maybe getting it out there for everyone to hear is the more important of the two sides to that question. Is that what you're saying? It is at this point. Yeah. yeah. So I would like a little early on here to open the floor to questions from the audience. Jane, <clears throat> Did Jane have something to say? Her hand is up. Jane, your hand is up. You can speak. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to shine some light on just, um, well, a couple of things. Just the the different way, and I'll try to be brief so we can save time for um, Q&A. Um, just real quick, just about how uh, we are seeing uh, traditional e ecological knowledge, knowledges um, used in um, different ways uh, when it comes to climate. Um, so we're seeing, um, you know, T TKs, I'm just going to say traditional knowledges, um, you know, serving how to define environmental baselines, um, understanding the magnitude and effects of variability of ecological um, uh, processes, processes help identify impacts that need to be mitigated, providing observational evidence for modeling different projections or um, helping us to, to ground different um, different models of, of climate adaptation or you know what what technologies we need for adaptation. Um, so I just wanted to name some of those um, 
ways that you know t, uh, traditional knowledges can be supportive. Um, and another contribution that's really important to climate that TKs have to climate change is just its holistic perspective, right? Which integrates climate change into a, a broad range of socioeconomic, uh, cultural, and ecological issues. Uh, whereas, you know, Western science is just only beginning to recognize the importance of holistic interdisciplinary principles. Um, so yeah, really bringing it back to the like, what's really the difference between, uh, you know, creating solutions from a traditional ecological knowledge, knowledges perspective versus just through a Western lens or, um, sorry, I know we're trying to get away from <laughs> this, this, the status quo, the status quo lens. Um, and then there is a lot of advancement, not just on the domestic side, um, that you know Morgan and myself have um, uh, talked to, but also two years ago at the, uh, but also on the international level, um, for the first time, two years ago at COP twenty six in Glasgow, uh, for the first time in history of the United Nations uh, Forum on uh, Convention on Climate Change. Um, 28 indigenous peoples were nominated from each of the seven, um, the seven United Nations indigenous socio-cultural regions um, to engage in negotiations <laughs> as knowledge holders and, and share experiences as indigenous experts with governments and um, the, the local communities and indigenous peoples platform is is helping organize that body. So um, I, I know I can't see the audience um, and sorry, I can't be there in person, but if you are a young person, a native young person interested in how we um, advocate for traditional knowledges um, at, the, at the international level, if you're interested in how we um, advocate for indigenous rights when it comes to climate change, um, please get engaged in the LSEP, the local communities and indigenous peoples platform. Or if you are an ally wanting to support with writing and with you know, uh, policy making, um, this, this body is, is so important um, for the advancement of our rights for achieving climate justice. And like so many um, you know, indigenous uh, advocacy groups, there's there's capacity needs. So um, I'll just I'll just uh, speak to that that there is always a, a welcome door for people to come and get engaged and really um, work with us and collaborate on on um, different initiatives in these particular spaces. Um, it's it's a great learning experience. You get to meet indigenous peoples from all over the world. Um, and and really get trained in in indigenous rights um, based approaches um, and 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 skill yourself up in that way. So just wanted to make that plug and also share a bit about that work. Um, and last year at at COP twenty seven in um, Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt, NDN Collective actually partnered with the office of um, oh man, sorry, I'm going to forget the the acronym, the Office of um, Science and Technology, I believe. <laughs> um, on, uh, it's the one that, yes, it is the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. We actually did partner with them on a panel about um, indigenous knowledge, uh, indigenous knowledges in global climate science policy and action. So uh, just, you know, these collaborations, these partnerships are really key. And I really hope that we can keep, keep those kind of collaborations going. Um, like I said, it's important to have community voice as well as the tribal government voice. Um, and I just, I really look forward to more of those types of partnerships as well as bringing in our youth um, to those types of spaces. Anthony, was she talking about the office of the White House? Yes, yes, yeah, the same one that did the help with the guy or led the guidance memo. Oh, very good. Okay. 
So anyone else on the panel want to drop in and then we're going to go to the audience. Go ahead. Just can you get the mic over there. Thank you again. <clears throat> you know, I could you identify yourself for us? Sure. Shay Sean Mulford in a share. Cut in a Sunday and Schlimm. My dash Disney Bushes Chain. Ask Chee Dutch Chain. Hot Sotney Dutch and Limit. Um, you know, we're talking about these nation states around the world finally identifying that they're in trouble globally, you know, environmentally. And they're beginning to look to uh, the original people for some sort of knowledge. What do we know that, that they don't? And the one thing that they have to understand is they can't use our knowledge. It's not for them. You know, the elder said it's like a seed. You take a corn seed and you put it in a bottle and you just put it in there. It's not going to grow. You have to put it in the right environment with the right soil, the right moisture, the right care, the right love to, to grow it. And that's how our knowledge is. And the, the system that the, the people have here, the government system, is so polluted that our knowledge cannot live in that system. You know, the spiritual people all over the world, I heard from uh, the Dalai Lama, he said, I may be the last. He said, maybe I'm the last. And I hear the pipe carrier for the Lakota, Lakota and Lakota Nation. 19th generation. He said, my grandmother told me if the people don't straighten up, I may be the last pipe carrier. So in order, order to uh, cultivate sacredness, we have to put it in the right environment. We have to cultivate our spiritual people. But this place is getting so polluted, they may not be able to survive. So if these nation states have recognized that they are in trouble, what they need to do is to acknowledge our right to free, prior, and informed consent. You know, they're talking about co-management. The elders always told me, he said, we don't manage the creator. We don't manage the land. The, man, the land knows how to manage itself. If anything, the land should manage us. It's a wrong way of thinking. So we have to understand our knowledge is dynamic, just like, any, just like uh, any one of you. If you're not feeling well, you go and you get diagnosed, and then they give you the medicine for it. Well, that was today. Tomorrow, it's a different condition. It's the same way with our knowledge. Today, if they come to the indigenous people, then we'll say, this is what you need to heal the environment, people, the creation. And then, but tomorrow it may be different. It's a dynamic thing. And only, and the medicine people said, only what is revealed will be interpreted by the spiritual people. So, that's what they're doing. If they want to know our knowledge, they have to give us consent so we can say, you can't do that action. No, that gives us the right to say no. And then through that, globally, indigenous people can begin to heal damage that's been done. So we can't get confused between co-management, co-stewardship, and all these semantics. It comes down to whether they will listen to indigenous people when we say no. And so far, we haven't seen that. But they don't have the right to our knowledge, nor will they have. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And that's an interesting standard that we'll share if we have a, a, an equal right to use the knowledge. The sharing is, is and the consent is part of the systems. That's interesting. Thank well, you like much. they said, the knowledge, they, they, they bring the different people in. There's more than one. 
Yes. It's just like the three wise men, they check off with each other as they're beginning to diagnose and work on things. So it's, it's it, within our own system, we already have our, our checks and balances. And, and I would say that the importance there is to recognize that what we're doing is building relationships among people and respecting the people that are involved so that they can come together with, as a unit, do a better job of, decide, of stewarding the land or stewarding the situation. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Yeah, we have no choice but to work together. We're in trouble, so we have to work together. We've got the White House there. The one thing that I noticed is uh, we talked about the MOU from 2012, uh, and I remember calling Jody Gillette at that time. I said, Jody, what did you do? You just eliminated the spiritual people from this process. And she said, well, that wasn't the intent of the MOU. And I said, well, that's what's happening on the ground. Because what the United States did at that time is they said tribal governments will determine the spiritual authority. And I said, that's exactly what China did to Tibet. China said, this isn't the Dalai Lama. This is the Dalai Lama. And so now you have a state-sponsored spiritual person. So when that happened in 2012 and the government put under uh, the tribes who can be the spiritual person or not, all of a sudden the tribes are put in a position to develop state-sponsored spiritual medicine people. And until 13007, executive order also says, and religious leaders. And I have not seen that a part of this process happening uh, by the United States. They're going to the federally recognized tribes for government to government, government, to government consultation. They're not going to the spiritual people, which are actually the holders of that knowledge. And so, as we said to NCAI in their process, we said, let's put into their resolution that government to government consultation is what's required by the United States. But to complement that system, we have to bring the spiritual people into it, not in replace of it, but to complement it. Yes. And I think that needs to be strengthened as we move forward in this discussion. Thank you very much. Yes. Let me open the floor for more questions. Yes, go ahead. So we had an online question. We'll okay, switch. Jeff, yeah, go ahead. You guys are in charge of the questions. <laughs> One of our, our team members on Zoom was going to comment about how a lot of the panelists today have explained how indigenous knowledges are fundament fundamentally different than Western science knowledge. Um, so how are we going to include indigenous knowledge in a federal agency plan that's primarily based on a Western scientific model? So the question is, how do we include it in a, in a well, let's, let's see if uh, Anthony has an answer for that. Yeah, in the IK memo, I'm just scrolling through it, but there is a section that talks about indigenous knowledge as evidence and that it shares similarity, while well, different, it shares similarities with non-Indigenous bodies of knowledge. And so at one point it's saying recognizing and valuing the difference in Indigenous knowledge, but it's also one saying it's valid form of knowledge, valid as any other body of knowledge. And two, it's not, it doesn't depend on validation of those other bodies of knowledge either, but there are similarities. You know, there's just um, systematic approach to conclusions, et cetera. And so, from what the gentleman was saying here, this is on the indigenous people's terms, um, the application of indigenous knowledge in the federal context, um, tribal nations consent. And so there are examples in that indigenous knowledge guidance memo, 16 examples of how it's already been applied. And so I would encourage maybe a review of that to see how it's working in the real world, but there definitely is space for multiple bodies of knowledge to work together to inform a positive outcome. So I'm going to ask our people in charge of the questions, what's next? Oh, uh, we can go to the back here, unless um, either of our online participants also wanted to answer that question. If not, we can move on.
Thank you. Um, so the, the question is uh, based on comment that uh, Chairman Good made, and uh, also as well something that uh, Dr. Noisy uh, mentioned earlier. And, and there's there's kind of this tension, right? And this is also identified here um, uh, by my uh, Dene uh, uh, colleague over here that the there's this tension between the knowledge that Indigenous people possess and the knowledge and the practices that everybody needs and and um, at the heart of it seems to be this element of control. Uh, and, you know, so one, uh, I guess, potential kind of regulatory mechanism or framework uh, is, as was being talked about here, is this uh, free prior and informed consent. And so I, I'm curious to hear from the special rapporteur and, and also from uh, Mr. Rodman um, with respect to the free prior and informed consent as it relates to indigenous knowledge um, and how you see the, the, the value of consent and the utility of that moving forward and the role um, that that consent and that, that control, the indigenous control of these practices playing um, internationally and then here domestically, whether it's uh, in the examples um, that you're talking about there, Mr. Rodman. So, um, or in any of your previous studies, uh, Mr. Special Rapporteur, thank you. Well, I think that um, uh, the consent uh, doesn't mean that you have to say yes, because the consent also is the consent of the of indigenous peoples, and it's a discussion among themselves. And then the consent has to come to say yes or to say no. And in this case, uh, I think that uh, uh, indigenous people are uh, they have right to say yes to, to, to use the scientific knowledge of indigenous people to the rest of the world. And for example, uh, in my own country, the knowledge to modify, I'm, I'm talking about uh, 3,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, modify the corn and to the corn that we, are, that we have today, it was not only for the Mayan peoples, it's for all the humanity. So that is a difference between the scientific knowledge that indigenous people had that is created not only to benefit one a small group, it's for, for all humanity. And that is the difference. And, and unfortunately, we are living in a very individual world today that now we have to, we, we need to have that consensus from indigenous people to use that knowledge. Because if not, those uh, transnationals that is going to be more wealthy than ever. Just an example, the, the uh, chemical, uh, medical chemical uh, industry, they are million, billionaires on the base of the indigenous knowledge. They took all indigenous knowledge from the Amazonian, and now they are creating many, many issues, uh, chemicals uh, to recreate all the knowledge that indigenous people have, have in the Amazonian. And the other thing is only the aspirin, just to a small, a small example, the aspirin. I don't know if you know where the aspirin is coming from. It's very, it's very a small example. And it's uh, of the skin of the will. And is that is something that the indigenous people know long before ago. I remember my grandfather, when he had a caring, or he had a fever, he never took an aspirin. He always go to the wood and take some uh, skin of the willow. He boiled it and he, he used to take that uh, for, for fever or um, a headache. But uh, now <laughs> in my town, we don't have any more willows. Why, why is that? So that is the problem. And I think it has to do a lot, the consensus with uh, the respect of indigenous people. Uh, scientific knowledge. Thank you for <clears throat> again reminding us of that terrible problem. Beth, did you want to? Just really quickly, that yeah. the Indigenous Knowledge Initiative, as described in the memo, mentions consent explicitly. And so anytime you can get a federal document to mention that word, it's going in the right direction, right? And so it's not something that it's, this is not meant to be necessarily a quick thing, a 
applying indigenous knowledge to a policy document because there should be that lead up to that decision. There should be that relationship to the people to understand the context. Part of that memo also makes a point to say federal government should understand the historical context for whatever community you're working with, acknowledging the racism and imperialism that is part of that, that, that history, right? So again, it's really attempting to make sure that it's done in a, in a good way, led by the indigenous people, and it's not just the federal government doing this in a vacuum, because that would be insane. I wanted to say in response to your problem, this guy <clears throat> describing this problem of the knowledge being stolen and then the biological companies making money off of it, it would be a lot better if they were forced to share their profits. The, the problem is monopoly and people have been in the morning were complaining about capitalism. And uh, one of the aspects of that that's so annoying is the allowing of people not to share, allowing them to keep it all for themselves. And the idea that you could have authority, authority should come from your ability to be generous rather than from you what you have. But it's not only that. If you allow me just to go have your story. Yes, go ahead. It was 1997 when we were starting to discuss the, the Cartagena Protocol, how to implement the Cartagena Protocol in Montreal. There was a meeting there of scientific people with indigenous people in Montreal. And I remember that I, 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 my statement was that they have to respect indigenous people's scientific knowledge. And one of them, he stand up and he said, what do you have, why you are calling scientific knowledge indigenous uh, customs? We have been developed scientific knowledge when you were living in caves. Oh, you're, that must have been fun to hear. <laughs> so, but uh, let me, let me think of you. And I, when I, I started to, to look in the list of the, the, the people who were participating there, he was a Russian guy. And of course, he gave me a very good opportunity to tell him, if you allow me, I told him, because you start in that way of speaking, insulting people. I will tell you that 100 years ago, you were in caves. <laughs> we were 3,000 years ago. Uh, our people, they were in a very good developed uh, society. And you 100 years ago, you were in caves with the Tsar. So that was the discussion that we have. Oh, it sounds like night. a really productive discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Tell you that this discussion is not a new discussion. Oh, it's very first, yes. So it's a long time ago discussion. So Jade and then uh Chairman Good wanted to comment okay, good. as well. <laughs> Thank you. Um Thank you, whoever's helping with the facilitation. Um, <laughs> so this conversation around consent um inspires me to mention a couple of things, um, or just yeah, reiterate. Um, the first is that we are doing our advocacy from a Indigenous rights-based approach and really training up um, ourselves and our youth around, um, you know, things like the United Nations, excuse me, the United Nations Declaration on um, uh, of Indigenous Rights. Sorry, acronyms. UNDRIP. Um, and I, I think we just really do need to strengthen how we talk about Indigenous peoples as rights holders. Um, to quote one of my dear colleagues and sisters, uh, Janine Yazi, who um, has, has for a long time worked with the Indigenous um, International Treaty Council, um, Indigenous peoples are not just stakeholders. We are not just um, to use the term colonial subjects to colonial powers. We are rights holders with our own body of recognized treaty rights, inherent rights and international rights. And, and we deserve to be recognized as such. Um, and so, you know, I think just around to, to strengthen, you know, our work around free prior and informed consent 
um, which we do want um, in, in these, you know, as in, knowledges are incorporated or not incorporated or protected um, in, in climate adaptation plans, um, et cetera, uh, you know, I think it's, it's important to make sure we're, yeah, again, just doing our advocacy and, and double downing in coming from a, an indigenous rights-based approach and really understanding, you know, what, what our rights are and how to use them. Um, the second thing that came to mind, um, just as we're talking here about, you know, co-optation and um, the concerns around the use of indigenous knowledge or or even our cosmologies, um, I we really do, and I just want to name it because I haven't heard the term come up yet. Um, and, and that's just being very weary of what we're seeing uh, really trend in the climate space, which is nature-based solutions. Um, these types of solutions involve uh, protecting, eco protecting ecosystems to sequester and store carbon. Um, but in reality, what we're hearing from indigenous communities throughout the world from the Amazon to different countries within Africa, um, to here in the US um, or so-called US, nature-based solutions are co-optations really of indigenous worldviews and also a strategy meant to uh, erase, um, meant to erase indigenous-led movement solutions and our demands necessary to to continue what we've already been doing, right? It's a co-optation of indigenous knowledges. Um, and so, yeah, there's a whole effort and, and initiative, so many different initiatives working on challenging nature-based solutions that have been adopted by fossil fuel companies, by corporations like Nestle, who are actively, you know, uh, bringing harm and, and um, carrying out harm against our communities. So, uh, you know, just to say nature-based solutions um, are, are not good um, and really just another scheme to um, support fossil fuels and industry and corporations to keep polluting. Oh, and just one last thing. Um, we, to just, yeah, just to sum up, like, I also just want to urge, uh, you know, folks interested in in this. All of this work is just we we need folks involved in climate financing, um, organizers and um, advocates involved in in this topic of climate financing. Um, we really need to watch where the money is going when it comes to protecting biodiversity or conservation. Um, one example I want to share is this past year at the um, climate conference in in Sharm el Sheikh. Um, it uh, the uh, there was a decision made um, uh, by the Biden administration to um, invest in. And I'm I'm sorry, I had the link open and then I lost it. Um, shoot. Um, anyways. Uh, a uh, climate financing facility was created um, essentially to support indigenous led conservation. But what we're seeing with a lot of these uh, funding streams meant for indigenous peoples um, is that they're first given to an intermediary, like an organization like the Nature Conservancy or um, Conservation International. And then those dollars effectively kind of disappear. Um, one, another example is, so that that's an example of something that a decision that was made recently around, um, you know, financing to indigenous peoples to advance um, biodiversity protection. But the, um, the other example I wanna share is um, so from a decision in, from the last COP, 20, the, la the previous COP, 20, uh, COP that happened prior to Egypt, uh, the one that happened in Glasgow, a decision was made for philanthropy to invest $1.7 billion in um, indigenous conservation. A year later, a report came out 
um, show, showing us that 7% of those dollars, 7% of the $1.7 billion commitment actually made it directly to indigenous peoples, 7%. So again, you know, we need to really be watchful around how these these dollars are, are moving to our communities and who these intermediaries are. Are they indigenous organizations that we trust to manage these dollars? Or are they big green um, um, entities that are really there to capitalize off of indigenous knowledge, to capitalize off of indigenous peoples? Um, and so I, I just wanted to name that because I think it, it is related to all of this and how we are resourced to protect our people and our communities and our knowledges. Thank you very much for that. I'll turn it over to our questionnaire, questionnaire management. Oh, uh, Chairman Good. Chairman Good. Coming. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, again, very though. Um, that was very good on, on Jade's part. And, you know, listening to um, a, cu a couple of things that I wanted to, to bring back up was that uh, uh, the one gentleman that was uh, speaking earlier from the audience, you know, looking at um, our knowledge, the, the moment that you talk about an archive um, scares the hell out of me, you know, because, you know, we just don't have protection over over any of our knowledge and no matter how you what kind of barriers you throw around it and then if you put that back to the universities like berkeley for instance they're getting rid of their anthro library and it's taken us decades for native scholars to be able to get in there and and study and now all of a sudden it's going to be gone and be put in different places and spaces and we won't have that access. And so um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that over we, over the years that, that we've been involved with the Euro-American, where's the trust? You know, where's the, where's the trust we have, have never had that? And that's one of the main reasons why most of our people won't even bother to tell where our cultural sites are until you almost stumble over them or you're gonna really make damage to them. Um, I get reports every day, three, four different people out there doing some kind of development. And unless they're actually going to damage one of our sites, I still won't tell them anything. It's um, it's the only way of, of trying to protect it. And so these are very important um, aspects that we have to really take a harder look at uh, for that part. One of the things that Jade was bringing up in terms of the, the finances, and I know the, the, the other young gentleman over there, Annalisa, I believe it is, was talking about the 3030 program I'm involved with the 3030 program. We have 400 acres we're trying to preserve. We, it's where we hold our cultural burns. It's where our gatherers have access to come and tend the land and, and be able to tell us what type of, how to burn, how they, how they want us to burn. And yet at the same time, um, we're trying to find funding and the funding that's supposed to be there for acquisition is not there. The funding that's there has switched from acquisition to conservation and conservancy. And then they tell us, oh, we'll give you 100% for the land for the easement on a fair market value. But the firm fair market value is lower than what the land is being assessed for in the taxes that we're paying this is you know this is what we're we, you deal with when once it gets down to the the bottom line of of the folks that have the money doling the money out 
and then try getting that money. So, you know, real, real serious issues, actually. We're, we're not there. It's really, the, we thought the 3030 program and even the nature-based solution program is still up in the air. It's being finalized right now. But again, it's all in the same same boat of trying to if there's land out there that needs to be preserved then preserve it and i've said the same thing about grants you know why, why if i'm the one that's doing the meadow restoration if i'm the one that's out there doing the cultural burning and if i'm out there the one that's doing the restoring and teaching people how to do that why is it i have to fight for 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 every dollar when they just take money and hand it over to others you know the system is broke and we got a long ways to try to fix it thank you very much so uh do we have some more questions we have a we have, there was one over here we're just going to do one on zoom and then we'll we'll get to that one over there okay Okay, so another online member wants to ask, could you share more information on how college students and young professionals can engage in organizations that contribute to efforts discussed today, such as the local communities and indigenous peoples platform? And maybe that, maybe Jade can speak on that. Did Jade hear that? Ye yes, I heard the question. Sorry, I'm just rereading it because the audio was a little out. Um, yeah, uh, you know what, I think the best way to connect on that is just to, um, connect with me and I can, um, so there's the local, uh, communities and indigenous, uh, local indigenous, sorry, acronyms again, and it's Friday afternoon, my, my Friday brain is, is really showing here. Um, <laughs> local communities and indigenous peoples platform. Um, there are, uh, as I mentioned um, in some of my remarks, there are eight different socio um, cultural uh, bodies uh, that represent all the different regions um, in, that, in that body. And so, um, we work with uh, the North American um, body and uh, we create, yeah, we select, you know, representatives, but that's, it's all, it's just kind of like a working group and uh, we're, we're a part of that. Individuals can be a part of that. Um, there's no real, like, um, there's not a lot of barrier to support and to be a part of it. Um, as far as uh, if you are indigenous and native um, and want to, you know, get involved in that, I think allies, like it's, it's a little uh, different, just, yeah, we, you know, there needs to be some relationship building. Um, but all to say, I think, uh, yeah, please reach out to me. I can I can support in getting people connected, especially the Native youth who are interested in engaging in that space. Um, and there's other there's other groups to link up with um, who are involved. Like I mentioned earlier, the um, International Indigenous Treaty Council. They do amazing work in skilling up and training up youth to engage in these different spaces. So please look into their work um, and I'll, I'll drop some more info in the chat, but yeah, there's different avenues to get involved. And then Chairman Good also has his hand raised. Please don't put it down. Uh, just real quick to, to uh, add to what Jade was saying or and on the question. So um, when we do cultural burning, medicines come back because the fire hasn't been on the land for 100 years 120 years and that medicine is laying there there's one thing that i promulgate a lot and that is that every species every species bear lion gnat bee ant everybody has their medicine everybody needs their medicine but where is their medicine and that is 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 serious. It's also 
you know, when we had the pandemic that swept the world, my first, very first question was, where did it come from? And if it came from a, a, a species, then where's the medicine that, that could take care of it? And this is very important thinking because it's, it, it is that traditional ecological knowledge that, that we hold and to know, you know, what kind of medicine does bear eat, does he need? What kind of medicine does coyote need? What kind of medicine does dog need? Horse, what kind of medicine do we need? And so when we burn, these medicines come back and, you know, it might be, uh, you know, I'll just throw a couple of things out there, but like uh, Pacific Cynical that is used for snake bites. And, and, or, and, or some of the other medicines, like even, even tobacco. And so when we burn and the summertime comes and some of our fresh plants have all come up and, and there might be four or five different plants that, that come back up in a burn, one of them will be tobacco. And the grasshoppers, when they come through, they just literally wipe the tobacco out and leave all the other plants, you know, and then along there'll be some other little, uh, little insect bugs that come along and there's a certain plant they'll attack and it's, it's what they need. It's, it's the food, it's the medicine that they need. And this is, this, this design, you know, wasn't put there by us. This design is put there by creator. And when we talk about TEK, when we talk about trying to understand traditional ecological knowledge, you need to be talking about the spirituality of life because that's where we start. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, panelists. Uh, my name is Andrew Curley and I'm in the School of Geography, Development and Environment. And my question is uh, directed at Anthony Rodman, although um, everybody can uh, answer it. But um, uh, my question is based on uh, experience on the Navajo Nation. And I'm wondering um, to what degree are there opportunities for uh, the use of, of traditional knowledge or indigenous knowledge in reforming existing policy, existing like land management policy? And so, you know, when I'm thinking about the, the use of kinds of knowledges and different kinds of epistemes. We go back to the 1930s and soil conservation science and the way that the federal government was implementing a land regulation and, and imposing certain kinds of regulations on the Navajo Nation. To this day, our land tenure system is, is inherits a lot of those logics. Even if the science has changed, we still have 1930s justification, 1930s Western science justification or the, the actual practical implementation of who has access to land and what kinds of things they can do on the land. And I think there's analogies in like water too. Here we are in the, in the Colorado River Basin. You know, we have very up-to-date science being generated here at the University of Arizona, but a lot of the existing policies derive from more than centuries ago about water allocation. So how do you amend these existing policies, especially when we're talking about indigenous land tenure? and making opportunities, or what kinds of opportunities are there for, um, for the, these kinds of indigenous knowledges, like an indigenous land management system, has been, well, in this case, an abomination, but maybe elsewhere. Yeah, thank you for that. The IK memo, I think, creates and opens windows of opportunity to influence policies like what you're mentioning. Anywhere where there's a federal policy that relies on scientific input for the operation of that policy should now be considering the indigenous knowledge relevance and implications to that. So whether that's soil management or whether that's um, water quality or whatever it is, where there is an opportunity to apply indigenous knowledge, especially where science is related, then that should be considered. Um, it should have always been considered that this memo memorializes that. And there may be in some situations where there are statutory barriers, but there's, I mean, those are probably 
those are less than the bigger opportunities that are out there where it can be applied like clear as day, you know? So, um, so yes, those opportunities are there to influence those um, federal government's approach to soil and water, et cetera. So I noticed that we've arrived at 45. I think that will conclude our panel for today. Um, thank you everyone for coming. I know it's been a long day. I really appreciate you all being here. Um, and I hope you have safe travels back, back to your home. And thank you so much to our panelists in person and online. So thank you.